and uh, orbital shapes and energies and maybe even hybridizations and geometries and stuff like that. But, but when you really dive down, dive down, there's this really deep rabbit hole of, of oh my gosh, I cannot get my brain around this. And, and so I ended up in the process of writing, just having to dive deeper and deeper and deeper. And in the process of churning on this, I felt like, you know, parts of this I feel like I've seen before somewhere else. And, and really what was happening was, was I have this, this view on my Christian faith that was kind of sitting alongside my view of, of quantum mechanics. So, uh, so I started churning on this talk. And, um, and, and so tonight, tonight's talk, or this afternoon's talk, is, is really a, is kind of a, a hybrid talk. It's, it's kind of a faith and science talk, if you will. It's, um, we're gonna talk about quantum mechanics. We'll take about 40 minutes to talk about these really weird ideas. You're not gonna like it. But, um, but then we're gonna circle back and, and kind of step back and say, okay, where have we, where have we seen this before? Um, I will tell you that I put this t talk together last year. Um, they do an annual lecture series at Camp Gilead, which is a Christian camp uh, down the road. As an aside and as a quick plug, I am giving a talk there tonight. So if your brain doesn't hurt by the end of this one, you probably weren't paying attention. Um, but if you just are that person that needs to run an extra five miles at the end of the workout, there is a talk tonight on a totally different topic. And tonight's is easier. Tonight's is a cool down. It's, uh, we're going to be talking about water and the wonders of water. It was a little low level for science majors here, um, but, uh, but that will be a totally separate talk tonight. But, but I got to put together this talk uh, that we're doing now, the quantum talk last year, and then also presented it kind of as an apologetics talk on my state university campus. I teach at Murray State University, which is in West Kentucky. And so I thought, you know, I really kind of want to challenge some of the worldviews and perceptions that are out there. How can I do that? And so this was sort of an apologetics talk. Now, I, I know the crowd I'm talking to today, and so I'll probably dial talk less about the apologetics, but I also think that there's, but I am going that direction. So when, when we get to the end, I'm going to talk about the Christian faith alongside this paradigm of quantum mechanics. Uh, so this will be the weirdest talk you'll hear all week. Uh, so so just so you know, quick question. I see a lot of people here. How many, how many bio majors? Sweet. Pre-meds? Okay. Pre-health? Pre... Okay. Physics? Math? Physics? Chemistry, math. Okay, who am I missing? Physical therapy. Physical therapy. Okay. Anybody else? Actuary. Actuary. Actuary science. Actuary science. Okay. Cool. All right. See anybody, anybody else? Fun. Okay. Um. All right. So we're gonna dive into quantum mechanics now. First off, for those of you that haven't had chemistry or haven't had chemistry in a while, what is quantum mechanics? Well. Quantum mechanics describes the behavior of matter and energy at very small scales, at the subatomic scale. And, uh, and so we're gonna be diving into, into chemistry as we, as we do this. Now quantum mechanics, as I, I mentioned, it, it's really, physicists would probably claim it as a branch of physics, and, um, but it carries over into chemistry. And so quantum mechanics has had this, this incredible impact on on the world around us. Everything from our modern periodic table to superconductors to solar cells to your, the phone, your, the camera in your phone relies on the principles of quantum mechanics. This is something that in a sense is well understood and well used. A lot of ways maybe in the same way that gravity is well understood and well used. You know what gravity is going to do. Now why? That question gets deep in a hurry. Why would these two masses be attracted to each other? Um, why would it be proportional to the, uh, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them? You know, we've got lots and lots of questions that we could, we could throw at, at gravity. In the same way, physicists and chemists use quantum all the time. It is part of the toolbox. <coughs> but beneath that is this layer of weirdness that we all kind of ignore, and, uh, or at least don't always know what to do with. So, so we're going to dive into into that. Let me warn you from the outset, you're not going to like this at all. Roger Penrose was a Nobel laureate in quantum um, physics. He said quantum mechanics makes absolutely no sense. It gets worse. Um, Erwin Schrodinger actually devised the Schrodinger equation, really the central equation of quantum mechanics. 
And his take on it was, I don't like it. I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. It's that bad. So, what is it? Well, let's take a step back in, in history to, to, try to try to launch into this and figure out what's going on. So we're going to start with Isaac Newton. In 1687, Isaac Newton published his Principia Mathematica. This laid out his familiar equation, Newton's three laws of motion, force equals mass times acceleration, and so forth. Um, and these laws and, and the concepts that he laid out in the Principia really became the guiding light for describing how matter behaves. And we use Newton's laws all the time. Everything from, you know, anytime we want to design anything from, from staplers to skyscrapers to airplanes, we're, we're applying Newton's laws of mechanics. So this became the central guideline and it's incredibly precise in what it, what it can do and how it can describe the world around us. About 200 years later, James Clerk Maxwell was able to describe the motion of uh, electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves, similar to Newton, a little more complex, but similar to Newton, using this series of mathematical equations. And so cast your mind back, if you will, to 100 years ago, 120 years ago, the world is this incredibly optimistic place. We have Isaac Newton, who has developed these laws of motion, and we can describe anything we want in terms of how particles move and how they behave. And then we've got James Clark Maxwell. We've got these laws that describe the propagation of energy. And we have matter over here, and we have energy over here. We've got it all figured out. And, and right in the crucible, this is post maybe the first stage of the Enlightenment, but, but right in that crucible of Enlightenment thinking, we know all there is to know. We can figure out, we can describe anything about in the world around us in terms of these wonderful equations that relate matter and energy. Except there were these few little irritating things that hung around. One of them was a hot stove. Um, you've all seen this. You, you heat the stove up, it glows, right? And this, this process is called black body radiation. Now we can define black body radiation a little more rigorously if we want to, but this is really what it is. You heat something up, it glows, it gives off light. And in fact, if you're a blacksmith, you can, you can look at a piece of metal and actually tell the temperature uh, by the color that it is, it is producing. Um, and so we can, we, this relationship was, was well known. But there was a problem. The equations, Newton's equations and, um, and Maxwell's equations totally fell apart when it came to explaining the intensity and the energy of the wavelength of, of light that was produced by a black body object. Um, in fact, it, it did okay as long as you were down in the infrared region, you got to the visible region, it started to fall apart, and by the ultraviolet, it was completely off. Uh, physicists at the time just could not figure out what to do with it, and they actually called it the ultraviolet catastrophe. Like this, our equations totally fall apart well, what, what do we do with this? Well, the first nugget, the first insight came about 1901 when Max Planck said, you know, if the matter ha only had certain energies so that it was only emitting light at certain frequencies of energy, then this would resolve the question of, of the ultraviolet catastrophe. Okay, well, what does that mean? Certain frequencies of energy, no idea what that means. Okay, so, so where do we go with this? Well, <clears throat> a couple of years later, Albert Einstein was working on a similar problem. This, this idea that if you shine light on a piece of metal, if the light has enough energy, it can kick an electron off. You can produce an electric current. Now, any, <coughs> any solar cell, this is basically what you're doing. You're shining light, you're producing an electric current. Um, uh, but, again, it wasn't behaving the way the classical equations predicted. Einstein took Planck's idea and said, you know, we could think of this if we think of light traveling in these packets. And he, he termed Planck's packets photons and described them as these little packets of <coughs> light energy. And you've seen, probably seen photons before and seen this term before. And he said, you could describe the energy of a photon based on its wavelength. Okay, <coughs> fine so far. But the idea here was that this was the first step away from normal because 
we had traditionally thought of light purely as waves. You watch the waves lap in across the, onto the ocean, they're not going in little packets, they're continuous waves rolling up onto the shore. What Einstein, <coughs> excuse me, it's spring break for me, I haven't talked in a week, this is weird. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> give me just half a second here. What Einstein and Planck said was, was no lights traveling in these little packets. They have a wave characteristic, but they're kind of little packets, like little BBs or something. This was a step away from the wave model and towards more of a particle model of, of light, if you want to think of it that way. Okay. Well, he, it continues on. One of the big challenges of, of the early 20th century was what's the structure of the atom? How do electrons behave within the atom? How is visible light produced? And in 1913, uh, Niels Bohr pr proposed this model of how light was produced. And it came back to this idea of why were there only specific energies of light produced by the black body radiation? And what Bohr said was, okay, Let's think about the atom like this. Think about a nucleus, and we've got just a hydrogen atom to, to keep it simple, with particular energy orbitals around it. And if this atom absorbs energy, it excites an electron up. Okay, so um, if the electron is excited up, it can relax back down, but it has to be the electron has to be in one of those different tracks, level one, level two, level three, level four, one of those different orbits. It has to occupy those. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with this, this little race, it was called slot car racers, and I'm old. So, does anybody, you guys with me? You squeeze the little trigger, the cars run around the track, and usually I had the, the one with two tracks, and I would, I got two of them for two Christmases. I burned them both out within a couple of weeks, just you know, making that car go around the track. It was great. Um, uh, <clears throat> but you could think about this. You could think about the electrons running around one of those tracks or the other, but the electron had to be on one track or the other, one orbit or the other, but it couldn't be in between. Imagine if you're on a stairway, um, you can stand on any step you want, but you can't hover between two steps. Same, same kind of idea. You had these certain allowed energies. Now that's cool. Um, but there's a couple questions that, that pop up with it. Let me hit this slide here one more time before I go off. So, you excite an electron up, it absorbs energy. That electron relaxes back down, it's gonna release a photon of light. It releases that energy as light. The energy that is released depends on the energy jump where it drops. So different drops can release different frequencies of light. We won't talk about how long that information is. Um, but uh, but that's that's what that's what what happens. Now, you guys okay so far? Everybody good? Okay. All right. It gets worse. But um, <laughs> so the Bohr model was was interesting. The strength of any scientific model really lies in its its ability to describe what's going on and to predict what can happen. And the Bohr model was really great in a couple of things. One, this this correlation between electrons jumping up and down between energy levels is still how we think about the, the production of light. This was, this was spot on. Two, his model enabled us to predict some of the main group chemistry, the alkalis, the alkaline earth metals, the, the halogens, the other p-block metals. <coughs> but it didn't do very well at all with the elements across the middle of the periodic table. Something was missing. What was missing? Well, there was another question, which Bohr said, okay, the electron can occupy these different energy levels, one, two, three, four, five, six, what, whatever, but it can't occupy the region in between. Well, why not? I mean, this is not really a slot car going around a, race, uh, a racetrack. This is ostensibly an electron orbiting some distance from the nucleus. Why can't it orbit at any distance it wants? Something's funny here. Well, so this idea hung out for just a few years until in 1924, a, uh, a, a doctoral student by the name of Louis de Broglie said, you know, electron energies make sense if 
electrons behave somehow as waves. And he kind of thought about a guitar. He talked, thought about strings on a musical instrument. In 1924, I don't think it was an electric guitar, but go with me. Um, it, it, you had these different vibrations, and you, you, you hit that string, you know, you get a particular vibration uh, that gives you a particular note. And we can describe that in terms of a standing wave. You have, you have your, your, your uh, you have a wave that's fixed in on both ends, and you can adjust that end on the fretboard, and you're changing the length of that string, and therefore you're changing the vibrational frequency of that wave. But there's only certain vibrational frequencies that can be allowed, because it has to be zero on both sides. So, De Bruyne said, okay, if we were thinking about standing waves, those have discrete energies. Maybe there's some relationship between the discrete energies of a standing wave and the energy levels of the electrons. He took this, uh, now, this is an interesting idea. How, did, how would you test for this? Maybe electrons have wave properties. How do, we, how do we test for that? Well, how do we know that light had wave properties? Well, one of the things that we saw was, and, and you've probably seen this, if you've ever seen a wave come in and hit some sort of blockade in the, uh, in the surf or along the lake, if you want to do this as a project, take two concrete blocks out to the lake while traveling it, um, and see, see what happens. We don't have that problem in Kentucky, but uh, um, so, uh, so what happens as the wave hits this barrier? Well, as the wave hits the barrier, it passes through, but it does a funny thing. When a wave passes through a narrow barrier, it fans out. And you can see it happening there in, in, in the lake water. You could play with this yourself and see this, this same thing happen. Well, what, okay, how does, so, so this behavior in and of itself kind of indicates the presence of a wave. If you put two slits in, you see something even better. You see this, um, you see this phenomenon where these waves, as they pass through, are overlapping with each other, and we actually get a really interesting pattern of dark and bright as these lights pass through. Let's take a look. So, if you were to take a laser, and this is just a regular old laser pointer, and you shoot it through a single narrow slit, you'll see a pattern like this. You'll see it spread out, and it actually produces this pattern of bright and dark spots. If you do a double slit, you see something similar, but it's actually even sharper. You see a much sharper pattern of, of dark and bright. Now, what's going on here? This is happening because of the wave properties. Waves could be at, in some places, the waves, as they change direction, they're gonna add together. We call this constructive interference they're gonna amplify each other. In other places, the waves are going to cancel each other out. We call this destructive interference. Okay, let's talk physics for just a second. You remember the swings when you were a kid, right? And you get on that swing. Now you got the swing when you were five, and I'm sure you were adorable. But at some point you were 12, and you were still adorable, but, but you're larger, right? And you start swinging, and, and we're not talking about the good playground swing, you know, the good industrial swing. We're talking about Mamaw went to Walmart uh, <laughs> swing, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And you start swinging, and those legs start pulling up on one side, start pulling up on the other, okay? And then your sister gets on the swing. Now, if you were smart, one of you went this direction, and one of you went the other direction, and you canceled each other out. If you were dumb, you both went like this. It, how many tips the swing? Sweet, that is a life well lived right there. If you if you got that story, that's a, that's a uh, that's a life good life well lived, and that's constructive interference and destructive interference. That's what that's what you're seeing. We could model this like this. So notice that you've got these waves. And this is not a perfect animation, but but you've got these waves kind of heading together, and in some places they're overlapping positively, in other places they're overlapping negatively, and that's where we see these different bright and dark spots. So, let's come back to our initial question. De Bruyne said, maybe electrons have some wave-like properties. How would we test it? Well, how do we, how do we know light was waves? Because it showed this, these interference patterns. If electrons are waves, electrons are gonna show the same kind of interference pattern. So, 
Du Bois had thrown down the gauntlet in 1924. It took about three years before a group, uh, a team of scientists in New York City uh, 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 did this. And they said, okay, let's test this, let's test this out. Now, what are, what are we looking for? If electrons are particles, if they're little BBs, and we shoot them at this double slit, imagine shooting, shooting 100 BBs or airsoft bullets or whatever at a barn door with two slits in it. Okay, pop, 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 pop. You're gonna, some might pass through one, some might pass through enough, uh, the other. If you spend enough time shooting BBs at that barn door, you might get almost a continuous stream of marks. So eventually it might look something like this. So if they're BBs, you're gonna see two lines. BBs went through the left slit or BBs went through the right slit. But if they're waves, you're gonna see something entirely different. You're gonna see all, all alternating dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright. Okay, take a second, make sure you're okay with that. Anybody, anybody have any questions so far? Y'all tracking with me okay? You sure? Okay, cool, I'm glad you're here. Um, all right, so, it took about three years. And the experimental setup was slightly different than the one we just modeled, but the idea was the same. That, that, that this group found that, that when they bombarded nickel atoms, that they saw this alternating pattern of dark and bright. They were seeing an interference pattern that was indicative of waves. Oh, electrons have wave properties. Interestingly, mathematically, it matched exactly what De Bruyne had predicted that it would have. So De Bruyne was onto something here with this idea. Well, what about larger particles? We're talking about an electron. Can we go bigger? Can we see the same pattern? Well, it's easiest to see if you're looking at electrons. This, in terms of wavelengths that you can measure, it's easy to measure. If you're talking about electrons, you're talking about wavelengths that are comparable to visible light. But can you go bigger? You can. So there was a very similar experiment run in 1999 with a group of scientists at the University of Vienna. They took buckminster fullerene. This is an allotrope of carbon, car 60 carbon atoms. It's about a million times the size of a single one. And they fired these C60 molecules, which are just massive compared to an electron, and they saw the same thing. The atoms were hitting here, but not here. They were hitting here, but not here. They were hitting here, but not here. Somehow, atoms, big old molecules moving through this slit were canceling each other out. Somehow, they were exhibiting wave properties. And what are you talking about? A molecule exists away from? I don't see this right now on this slit. Okay, uh, they hit here, they don't hit here. That's what I got, okay? And so you see, you see this idea, this idea of wave particle duality. So when we talk about quantum mechanics, there are five increasingly terrible ideas that we're going to, to hit. Um, they're shorter, but they're increasingly terrible, okay? So the first one is wave particle duality. Things have wave properties, things have matter properties particle-like properties, but really we see, we see both depending on how we set up our experiment. Okay, so that's big idea number one. Big idea number two, we can never perfectly know the precision, uh, or never precisely know both the position and momentum of a particle or a photon or, or anything like that. So, okay, what does this mean? You know, like, like, again, this doesn't make sense. If you, you can take a picture of a, a high cheek picture of a bullet shooting through an atom. And you say, well, the bullet's right there, and I know exactly how fast it's going. I got a picture of it. Well, to quote the great Rafiki, look harder. If you look closer, there's more there. If you zoom in on that bullet, you don't know exactly where that bullet begins and ends. There's some level of uncertainty and some level of, of zoom. We see the same idea with the laser. If I take a laser pin, and shine it on the screen, I say, oh, I've got a two or three millimeter diameter shining on a screen. I know within about three millimeters where that laser light is as it passes towards the screen. Well, what if I wanted to know tighter? Let me zoom in. Let me see if I can squeeze it through a little slit. Oh, shoot, we just saw this experiment. You take it from two millimeters wide down to a micron wide or a tenth of a micron wide, and all of a sudden, it stands out. Now you know its location as it passes through, but you know very little about the direction that it's moving. 
you have more uncertainty there as it passes through. Now this is a weird idea, but the more precisely you know something's location, the less precisely you know where it's going. It does not make sense on the large scale, but when we get down to the atomic scale, we can do these calculations and we, we look at an electron and say, okay, we have within an atom, we may know where the atom is, but we have no idea where that electron is within the atom. So, how do we describe atoms? Well, <coughs> this is kind of how chemists use the, the quantum model. So, we've moved from the Bohr model, where we're describing atoms strictly as positive and negative particles, to the quantum model, where we're describing specifically electrons, but really all particles, as, as waves. Okay, now how do chemists use this? Y'all have probably seen this before. Sp, d, f orbitals. So, if we're describing electrons within a chemical system, we're not really talking about, oh, the electrons are right here, it's moving this way. We say the electron occupies this energy, and this is the region where it's most likely to be. And those regions are wave shapes predicted by wave equations. Okay, so if you've looked at FPDF orbitals, what you're really looking at is wave equations. Go okay? All right, cool. Okay, so we've safely navigated two of the five big ideas. We've navigated the wave-particle duality, and we've touched on this idea of um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We never know precisely our momentum and position. There's an old joke that the policeman stopped uh, Heisenberg on the way home. He said, sir, do you know how fast you were going? I said, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. Uh, uh, okay, big idea number three. This is where it's going to start getting weird. Quantum mechanics is indeterminate. If we fire a set of electrons through that double slit, we end up seeing a pattern like this, where each white mark represents where one particular electron has hit the target. And you immediately see this wave pattern, here, not here, here, not here, here, not here. You see an interference pattern. Here's the idea behind quantum, but that's behind indeterminacy. We know that the electron is likely to hit in one of those bright bands, but we have no idea where it's going to hit. We just know it's statistically likely to hit there. Now again, this is super counterintuitive. This is not what we're used to. If, if you've ever played baseball, you see that, uh, you see that ball hit, you drop back, you do a quick bit of Newtonian mechanics in your head, which you're really good at, you watch that ball come down, you reach up, you catch the ball. At least, <laughs> I've told that's how it works for other people. Um, but, uh, but, but you've done this, you've used this idea of determinacy. If we know where something's going, we know where it's gonna land. The idea with quantum mechanics is no, you don't. It is statistically likely to hit here, 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 and here, and less likely to hit here, 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 and here because of this wave nature. Y'all hanging with me? How are we doing with that? We're okay. We're in good shape. Okay. So, let's do this again. There are more questions that we can, that we can dive into from this, but I need to tell you that you're not going to like it. So, if you want to take the blue pill, Become an English major today and, and leave the room. I will not judge. Okay? But it's about to get worse. All right, you still sitting here. So, I want to know does that electron go through the left slit or through the right slit? Well, how would we, would we do that? Well, one of the things you can do is you, well, we use an electron gun, an electron beam. And you can turn the voltage down on that electron beam where you're firing fewer electrons through. What if you turned it down a little more? You're firing two fewer electrons through. What if you were firing one electron at a time through that slit? This was this was a thought experiment, kind of a description of, of, of one of the big ideas of quantum mechanics, developed by Richard Feynman back in the 1960s. And he said, okay, if you were to fire a single electron through that slit, what would happen, DL? Well, let's take a look. Again, one more. But so let's take a look. Um, you start firing electrons one at a time. After a while, you might see something that looks like this. A little while longer, keep firing. Okay, you might see something that looks like this. Keep firing. 
You might see something. I don't get it. Keep firing. Keep firing. Oh. Even going through one at a time, these electrons are somehow interfering. We're still seeing an interference pattern. Even well, who are they interfering with? There's only one of them at a time. Are they are they going through the left slit or through the right slit? Oh, how can we figure that out? How are we are we going through the left slit or the right slit? Well, let's let's see what we can do. We know that if we shoot the particle through the two slits, we get something like this. But how can we figure out which slit it's going through? Let's do an experiment like this. Imagine that that you put two lasers one over each slit. You've got a little light detector. Now you could you could measure something big. Like if you if you want to if you have you know you have light detectors around your house, right? Motion sensors. You've got some sort of beam of infrared light or something like that. Something passes underneath it, it trips the detector. So this is what we've got. I've got two lasers. I can measure the current as they hit the detector underneath. So if a particle passes through the left one or the right one, what's going to happen? It's going to show up on that detector that something passed through the left or the right. I'll be able to figure out that that electron goes through the right slit or the left slit. You ready? So we fire it in. Again, this is Richard Feynman. We fire this. Here's what we see. Wait, what? If you try to measure. Oh, Nick, thank you. I was trusting my information. I appreciate that. Um, if we try to measure. What we're going to see is that it reverts back to Susan Beebe's at the barn door. We see the particle behavior. What's going on? Well, a minute ago, we were seeing marks when it hit the detector. When it hits the detector, we see it behave like a particle. It's making a mark there. It's, it's leaving its imprint there, just like a BB would. But when it passed through the slits, it was somehow behaving like a wave. Here, we're, trying, we're basically forcing a commitment. Are you a particle or are you a wave? And when you measure it, you change it. Now, that may bother you, but one of the underlying principles, and this is the basis of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you cannot, when you get down to the subatomic, you cannot measure something without changing it. How do you measure an atom? Well, you shine light on it. You see what happens when it absorbs light. <coughs> Well, it, when you shine light on it, you've changed it. You've altered it somehow. If it's absorbed energy, you have altered it. And you've altered its momentum in ways that you cannot predict. So this is what you're dealing with, is when you try to measure it, you end up changing it. OK. Y'all still in the room? Y'all OK? All right. So there's this idea. This is big idea number four, that wave-particle duality is complementary. And one of the principles of quantum mechanics is that the better you know the particle nature, the less you know about the wave nature. The more, the better you design your experiments to measure particle characteristics, the less you're going to know about the wave characteristics. The more you know about the wave characteristics, the less you're going to know about the particle characteristics. They're complementary. And that line is a little sharp, because Heisenberg says we really never know exactly. So we've got this little blur between the particle nature and the wave nature. All right, one last big idea, and this one's terrible. Uh, but it's the last one. So we see this idea that as that light, and, and this is true of anything we measure at the quantum level, that, that the photon or the particle seems to exist in multiple states until we try to measure it. The idea that the, the wave is passing through the left and the right and interfering somehow until we try to measure it, and then it's going through the left or the right. It's basically snapping to a particle, if you will. I, I a lot of times will think of, and I'm not sure if this is a perfect way to think about it, but a wave passing through, but the instant it interacts with something that can measure it, whether it's a laser or whether it's a screen or anything that, that it interacts with, then it snaps down to, to a particle. So you've got this idea that you have actually multiple different solutions kind of going on at, uh, at one time. <laughs> Uh, this is this is this is where the idea of the multiverse comes from. I'll come back to that here in just a few minutes. This idea that, oh well, well, how are we getting these different possible solutions, and why are we only seeing one? So, so how are you feeling so far? Yeah, about about like this. 
Okay, if this is how you feel, you are in good company. Albert Einstein hated this idea. He, he argued, and, and he and Bohr famously argued for years, trying to haggle through all of these issues. <coughs> and ultimately, he kind of had to come around to the, the idea that, I, I can't explain this, but this seems to be what's, what's going on. This seems to be what's happening. We have this fundamental question that Einstein would have to ask, Okay, I don't like it. I don't like the theory at all. I don't like what these measurements are telling me, but is it true? And if it's true, then you gotta figure out what to do with it. Yeah? So if we're looking at electron as a wave, you said. Yeah. So a wave can be charged. Charged? Like if we say that electrons are negative and protons are positive, but they act like waves. Do you wanna that's a great question. Um, do, do you want to? Can I phone a friend, Matt? <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. So, 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 so you're saying, can waves be charged? If we're saying that electrons have wave particles, they have a negative charge. We say protons. So how, how long do you have? It's, that's a so, beautiful question. Yeah. <laughs> that's, there's not an easy answer for that because I would, I'd start off by telling you that electrons really aren't waves. We just have wave functions that describe, uh, and they're the things that interfere, and then from that we can, dis we can use that to predict where they might show up. It's not saying necessarily that the electron itself is a fuzzied out wave. It's the wave nature is mathematical. Because it does have wave properties, but it's a mathematical property. It's, yeah. Well, and, and the other the other question I could add to that is, what does charge mean? Like we, we yeah. use that idea, uh, and I tend to think of it somehow in terms of some sort of wave interaction. But I have no, I don't, I don't even have any mathematical toolbox to begin to, to describe why why are these two things that we call charge? Why are these attracted to each other? Yeah. And these, oh, well, these repel each other, and these attracted to each other. Um, what, what does that mean? I don't know. We, we know what it does. We're real good at using it. But, yeah. um, well, there is a chance they're not attracted to. They're, like, if you, have, if you have, like, say, a positive charge and a negative charge, uh -huh. when you work it out quantum mechanically, there is a slight chance that they actually will repel each other. It's just an overall, statistically, they end up moving closer to each other Boy. because of their, it's like a bias on the wave function. Boy. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to do with it. It's a great question. And, also, and I'm so far out of my pay grade already. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. And no, so it's okay. When we are like shooting those electrons through that um, small gap. Yeah, the slit. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we see the gaps forming. Yeah. But they, once we shoot more and more, they form in different positions. So it's just like statistics. Like the more you shoot, the so it's not like it's constant. Well, and the statistics is right. The, the, more, the more measurements you make, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 like the better you understand the likelihood. You, you fire one or two, you don't know what the statistical distribution is. But you fire a million, you see it. Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good question. I appreciate that. Y'all good? Okay. I don't know what she just said. Oh, good. I can't work. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, me either, actually. <laughs> All right, that's great. Okay, so what do we do with this? Well, Einstein and Bohr went back and forth, back and forth on this idea. And, and, and there's a few different models. There's, there's what's called the Copenhagen model, which, which was, was the position that Bohr uh, espoused, which was, uh, okay, we don't, we don't really understand what this means. Uh, as she was just saying, this is a, this is a statistical analysis. We, Quantum mechanics doesn't tell us anything about why it's doing this. It's just these wave equations describe what it's going to do. Uh, this has been criticized as the shut up and calculate approach. Of, okay, you can, you can figure out what to do with it. You can design an instrument that uses these ideas, but, but why? We don't know. Um, there was the hidden variables interpretation uh, uh, that, that maybe there's something out there that we just don't see, something that we don't understand yet. And, and 
this ties in, and this, uh, this, if we knew the hidden variable, then all these equations would make sense, all this behavior would make sense, but we don't know. Okay, this one's kind of falling out of favor, but, uh, and then there's the many worlds interpretation. What if you have the statistical, if you, what if you have, every time you have a quantum event that could be A or B, pass through the left slit or the right slit, there's one universe where it passes through the left slit, another one where it passes through the right slit. I'll come back to that in a minute, but, uh, but, but this is, it, it's an idea. Um, all right, now, why should you care about this? Well, it, of course it's a foundation for chemistry and, and lots of routine stuff. There's also lots and lots going on on the horizon, and I'd love to explain this to you, but, but you're gonna have to talk about Dr. Hallman on that one. Um, I, I, I'm still struggling to get my brain around what this even is, honestly, but, but quantum computing, where you are used processing of different possible values and one value emerges. Um, uh, quantum cryptography, which is, is really interesting and ties into to an idea that, that Einstein first proposed. Um, and there's lots of stuff happening here and it's, that's, that's really hard to get your brain around, but again, it's something that can be applied and something that can, that can be used. Okay, you guys all right? All right, now good news, we're through the quantum part. So you say, okay, this is weird. This has been the weirdest 40 minutes I've had all day, and I watched the SpongeBob marathon. Okay, <laughs> um, what, what, am, what, am I, what am I looking at here? And, and, and really, I just need to get to class. I need, I've got these much more concrete things that I need to do. I've got places I want to go. Uh, obviously, I'm trying to live out my faith in, in, in a way that is meaningful and concrete. How do I, how do I tie this together? How do I tie this? These ideas of quantum mechanics with anything that's my real life, Any, anything of, of what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to accomplish, what my, what my faith is. And this was where I kept getting hung up. It's like I, I was just grappling with these, these topics. And so I want to share just a couple for a second. And this is kind of an outsider's take on quantum mechanics a little bit, or a, a marginal outsider's take on quantum mechanics. But I want to ask the question in the last 13 minutes or so, what, what can we learn from quantum mechanics? I want to share just a couple of couple of reflections and, and thinking about this through the lens, through my Christian worldview. What, where, where, am I, where am I going with this? So, number one, reality is much bigger and much different than we think. We feel like, you know, we've got the, we've got the, the table and the chairs and the Taco Bell and, and everything is just where it should be. But the truth of the matter is that reality is much bigger than what we think. My wife and I were watching Monk a, month, a couple of months ago. And, uh, and, and, and his assistant says, Monk, what do you believe? And, and he stands back and he says, I only believe in what I can see. Okay, well, that's great if you're a TV detective, but it doesn't match reality. The fact of the matter is, A, you're relying on lots of things you can't see. B, science says there are things that are much more complex, that the reality that we can see is undergirded by something that is very, very different, um, but equally uh, really defines the reality. Number two, this idea of, of duality. We talked about wave-particle duality. This idea I've seen before somewhere in Sunday school long ago. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is the, the ancient teaching that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. Well, how can he be fully God and fully man? How can you have a particle that is also a wave? You've got this strange duality that you can never quite explain and never quite get your <coughs> fingers around, yet here we are, okay? It, it actually, a related idea that sometimes just a single image doesn't fight. Anybody know what this is? I need a name. There you go. Well, this is the nitrate ion. Okay, and in Gen Chem, you learn about the structure of the nitrate. But it turns out that one Lewis structure really doesn't do it justice because the charges are distributed evenly around the three oxygens, and there's no way that we can show that symmetrically. So we do this thing called resonance structures. And so you may see where I'm going here. We have three different structures that we use to represent a single reality. Why do we have three different structures? Why can we not just represent these as marbles between this atom and this atom? Because they're not marbles. They're not little negative beams. They're 
wave. And as we describe this wave function, a single particle description is inadequate. In the same way, a single physical description is inadequate when we describe God. So, we go to the ancient theologians who describe God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We use three representations for a single entity. We see the same kind of thing popping up again. Shocking and persistent ideas. Einstein hated quantum mechanics. In fact, in 1935, he, he wrote a famous paper with uh, two other scientists, uh, Podolsky and Rosen, and, and said, this, this is so outlandish. If this is true, you're going to have this weird thing called quantum entanglement that is going to happen where these two particles, even though they're galaxies away, still somehow interact. Well, he, he threw down the gauntlet in 1935, I think it was, or 37. It took about 30 years before anyone figured out how to test this idea. Turns out that Einstein's objection was true that in fact you see these particles separated at a distance that still somehow, or photons, that, that still have some, some interaction. It doesn't make sense, it, I don't like it. it, I don't know how to get my brain around it, but it's true. So what do I do with it? Well, you think about, think about intellectual thought, especially for the last 400 years. Let's start with Machiavelli. Let's go through uh, Enlightenment atheists like David Hume. Let's continue to move, move forth into, into modern atheists like Richard Dawkins or, or the late Christopher Hitchens. People for hundreds and hundreds of years have been looking at the, at, at the story of Christianity and said, this can't be true. But here we are, 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, sitting in a room talking about it. It is shocking, it is offensive, people don't like it, but if it's true, there it is. There it is. It's still kind of kind of sticking around. These core ideas, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, these ideas that, that God loves us, that we are fallen, that, that he said Christ could restore us, that Christ was God incarnate, uh, and, that, and this promise of, of eventual restoration. Um, <clears throat> and that fundamental question, is it true? Quantum mechanics, I don't have to like it. My students don't like it. They tell me that I don't like it. I don't care. It, is it true? And if it is, then you gotta figure out what to do with it. I would say the same thing is true with Christianity. Um, Christianity is unique in that it asserts a fundamental, it's fundamentally different in its worldview, but it's also unique in that it asserts a testable hypothesis. So we'll come back to that here in just a second. Now, of course, worldview matters. I'm, I'm running out of time. But and I talked about this you know, at my state university not long ago. <coughs> worldview is really important. And this is why I'm such a huge fan of dual self calculus too. Um, because, because you ultimately have two worldviews. Either we are the product of chance or we are created by God. That has a huge impact on on. on my worldview has a huge impact on, on how I treat the people around me. And even if I'm following some higher code of ethics, that, you know, you can have certain people who are atheists who follow a higher code of ethics, that's not true. But if you dive, if you dig, at some point, not every atheist is going to follow that code of ethics. And the 20th century taught some really hard lessons about that. If that person that you interact with is either created in the image of God, or it is a freak cosmic accident, a clump of cells that will be dead soon anyway. So that affects how you treat people. Do you believe that Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it to me? Or is this some cosmological anomaly that's standing in front of you in the grocery store and in your way? Don't get that on um, okay, what? I'm joking. I'm kidding. So, what evidence do we have? Okay, so how do we know? One of the things that we see in quantum, this uh, sort of butts up against this, so this is not really part of quantum, but one of the things that we see over and over and over again is that the universe is fine tuned for life. We see these, these physical quantities that there's no reason why they have to be what they are. None that we can, that we can articulate or posit, but 
But nonetheless, they are. And if they weren't what they are, the universe wouldn't be here. The universe bears this mark of their creator. Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, wrote a remarkable scientist. says, the remarkable fact is that the value produced on the team has been very finely adjusted to make possible the development to life. If the electric charge of the electron had been only slightly different, stars either would have been unable to burn hydrogen and helium, or else they would have exploded. Okay? How do we deal with this? How do, how do we as scientists deal with this idea of this perfectly fine-tuned universe? Well, one of the ideas, and you'll hear this idea from time to time, circles back to quantum mechanics. Circles back to this idea of, oh, anytime you've got a quantum mechanical po possible outcomes, you have a different universe generating every time there's a different outcome. You end up with this idea of a multiverse, that there's all these possible multiverses. It makes for great science fiction. Okay, wildly entertaining. But there was a line, I think, in this movie where the three Spider-Mans come together, and I don't remember it exactly, but it was something like, oh yeah, that's true in your universe, but I'm from universe 789, something like that. Cute. Okay, that's right there, one of the problems with what if every, every electron interaction generates a new universe? You're not dealing with a thousand universes or a million universes, you are dealing with an infinite number of universes and within just an instant you are, you are dealing with this massive, unrecognizable number of universes. How does that relate to conservation energy? Every time you create a new universe, you have to create a whole new wealth of energy. I've heard people argue about this, but I don't buy it. Um, so, ultimately then, you end up with two phase statements. One, infinite number of universes, universes with different laws. Um, we end up in just the right universe, congratulations. We end up in, on just the right planet, life emerged by chance. Okay, fair enough. Or, we're created by God. Either way, you're dealing with a phase statement. Either way, you have to take something that you cannot explain, and you have to take this on faith. One view is every bit as religious as the other. Uh, so, you say, what if, given this, what is the most coherent explanation that I can work with? And I would assert that, that God is the most coherent explanation for life, and Jesus Christ is the most coherent explanation for God. Why would I assert that in my last minute or two? The, um, one of the things <clears throat> that really distinguishes Christianity is testable hypotheses. One thing we run into qu with quantum mechanics, is it true? I don't like it, it doesn't make sense to me, it's counterintuitive, I can't explain it. Why in the world would it be particles and waves at the same time? But the evidence is right here. What am I going to do about it? Okay, Christianity is unique among world religions because it is predicated on a single event. It is predicated on three days around 30 AD, this time of year. Okay, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we, we see this, and, and this is something that really has emerged in me. I didn't get it. When, when I was 20 and coming through, I didn't get this. But the more I've thought about this and wrestled with this, and one of the things we've seen even over the last 20, 30 years, if you've never read the work of Gary Habermas and a few others, there has been a tectonic shift in the last 20 or 30 years, whereas uh, uh, years ago, science, you know, lots of theologians or historians would say, well, the resurrection was added later. It was an add-on to, to early Christianity. No, no, the earliest apostles adamantly believed that Jesus Christ was risen. For example, Paul says, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is written in his first letter to the Corinthians. Thanks to some remarkable inscriptions uh, um, uh, and some details that he put in, that were in the book of Acts, particularly referring to the uh, Proconsul of, of the region at the time. We can date the book of 1 Corinthians reliably to 49 AD. This was less than 20 years, or right at 20 years after the death and resurrection. So this was this is Paul talking about. This is what I preached. This was the core message from the beginning. Christ is risen. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see this over and over and over again. This is the message. Can't explain it. Don't know what it is. He was dead, and now he's not. That's the message over and over and over again. So, you see this in the disciples. These are the disciples that all but John, history teaches us, went to, went to their death in gruesome ways. 
yet fearless in the face of it. Why? Because they had seen the works that the Roman Empire could dole out, which was pretty gnarly. But they had seen Christ overcome it. There was nothing that the Roman Empire could threaten them with that could compare with what they had seen. Death had been, as Paul said, swallowed up in victory. Last thing, legacy. One of the things about quantum mechanics that is that, that, that circles back, why is it important? Why do we care about this really abstract, really obscure idea? Well, because so much has come out of it. The periodic table, superconductivity, all of our modern technologies rely on this. Well, think about the Christian world for just a moment. Step back just a little bit to kind of a historical viewpoint on this. There's a great book by, um, by uh, a professor named Sarah Rudin. She's a, a classicist at Yale University. And, and she wrote about uh, a book called Paul Among the People that was really a little grisly, but really good, talking about the Roman world before Christ. And she's based on, based on their literature and, and everything we know about them. And it was rough. It was rough in ways we don't think about things being rough, rough in ways we can't imagine. But then along came Christians, and Jesus taught that whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. And pretty soon the Christians started taking care of their sick, started taking care of the pagan sick, started taking care of children who were left exposed, left out to die, which was a standard practice in that day for unwanted children. All of a sudden the first orphanages began to pop up. We continue to see relief efforts across the world. This was right around the corner from our house about a year ago when major tornadoes come through. You've got Christian communities descending. You are a part of this grand story, this beautiful two millennium story of the kingdom of God appearing on earth. You are part of that legacy and you will continue to be part of that legacy. It's a beautiful story and something like quantum mechanics. Okay, I don't get it, but here it is. I need to deal with it. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate this. I'm around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. And a totally different talk later on if you just want to hear something totally different. Y'all have a lovely day. Thank you so much.